Wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Rory. And I also would like to acknowledge that we are in Wurundjeri country and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I guess the other thing for me is that I, you know, I just continue to be so like humbled and excited by the incredible knowledge that, you know, lies within our First Nations people. And, um, you know, it's, it's been really uh, wonderful over the last sort of 15 years trying to incorporate it more and more into our practice. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about three of our projects. So fieldwork actually just turned 10. So we're quite a young practice. Um, I personally don't feel young, and my nine-year-old daughter has started calling me wrinkly face, which is uh, not very nice. Um, but look, we are a young practice, and we um, have been very fortunate to be able to work on some really fantastic projects. And what I want to talk to you about today is three projects, a housing project, an educational project, and a cultural project. So we as fieldwork are very interested in, I suppose, broadly speaking, sort of social infrastructure. Um, we don't do single private homes, and we can expand on that later during question time if you're interested, but that's uh, a very important, um, I suppose, distinction with field work. We're now working more and more towards, I suppose, community-type projects. So we don't really work so much anymore with private developers. Um, I think we need to log in again. I'm sorry, Rory. Oh, no, here we go. Um, so, and, and what we're trying to do now is we're doing more sort of social housing, more affordable housing, we're doing educational work, we're doing aged care now as well, our first aged care project, we do workplace, um, and also cultural infrastructure, so we're also working on the Kyneton uh, Creative Arts Precinct, which is a sort of, imagine Collingwood Yards, but for the country. So the first project I want to talk to you about is a Macaulay Road project, it's for Assemble. Um, it's a housing project. The existing building was actually quite a lovely building designed by Harry Norris. He's the designer that did Nicholas Building, and that's sort of quite interesting building in the city, which is going through kind of some massive transformations at the moment. We always try and pay homage to the sites that we're working on. So we tend to commission our friend Tom Ross, who's a really beautiful photographer. He goes and actually takes a, a photo essay of each of our projects. So it's not just sort of... Um, architects snaps on their iPhone. So with this particular one, there was actually a really beautiful um, tenant that lived in there. They actually moved next door, but it was actually a factory that made tapes. And funnily enough, people still use tapes, which is crazy, and CDs. So the typical approach to an apartment building is to do what they call a double load of the apartment building. You know, we've got a corridor in the middle, and we really didn't want to do that. We wanted to do something which was much more about focusing on the connective tissue between the apartments. And the reason for this is that well, for starters, it's just going to end up in a much better project, but it just fundamentally improves the amenity of all the apartments. It means that, you know, everyone talks about cross-flow ventilation, and you can draw as many little wiggly arrows as you like on a double load of the apartment building. It's still going to suck from a ventilation point of view, whereas by doing this, you get really great ventilation. But most importantly, that idea of sort of connective tissue, that sort of, you know, rather than sort of scuttling down a dark corridor, there's actually shared space. So that idea of kind of shared experience. And look, people throw this idea of community around a lot. You know, you can't design community. But what you can do is design a building that starts fostering neighborliness. And if that sort of forms community, then great. So I should mention that Assemble was founded with a vision to sort of deliver much higher quality and more affordable housing. Uh, the way that the current Assemble projects work is you have a five-year lease with a fixed pre-agreed lease uh, sort of price and then a pre-agreed price that you buy the apartment at the end should you uh, wish to buy it. About 30% of the apartments are key workers and they had a 20% discount to market as well. What's beautiful about that model of the five years uh, where people can lease the apartment, they can treat it like it's their home during that time, is that you kind of get to know the building and, and really it means that you align the interests of the architects who always want to do a good building, the developers who don't always want to do a good building, and the, and the end user who really wants a good building. So this model uh, works very powerfully in that way. So there's a really big focus on that connective tissue, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. But here's a diagram of the building. So we really had to sort of hang on to and respect and keep as much of the, the ground floor building as we could. Like a big approach with fieldwork is that let's not knock things down if we don't have to. So from a cross-sectional point of view, you can see that every apartment um, with, where the void is has got totally private terraces on the outside, either facing north or south. And then through the middle, you've got a walkway. So here's some views of the building. We just sort of finished it. That little cantilevered sort of silly thing, that's uh, just 
just a little sort of moment that denotes that that's actually the communal space. So there's a little communal balcony and communal um, multipurpose room up there. Some sectional views of it. And you can see that uh, people have really started you know, using that central space as an extension of their living spaces. We cheated a little bit by putting a few extra pot plants here, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, the building itself is a uh, precast concrete, and it's got these sort of corrugated panels of um, perforated aluminium. And the idea is to kind of have a sort of softened light to the north. But again, we've got really deep eaves to the north as well. So from a, so from a thermal point of view, it works really well. Uh, in the ground floor, I guess with assembled buildings, what we try to do is that we try to work out, like, what are the things missing from an apartment building? What are the things you actually could do in, say, a little terrace house that you can't do in an apartment building? And how can you systematically, you know, put in the communal facilities that allow you to have a pretty full life in an apartment building? I mean, this stuff's not rocket science, but it's funny. So few people kind of do it this way. So the first thing is a multi-purpose communal workshop. And that's, like, really to do all those messy jobs that you could do in a little shed if you had it in your backyard. Uh, the other thing we've done in this building is a biocomposting system. So all the green waste in the building gets composted and also from the zero waste cafe. We've got the sort of communal lobby space. This is a hospitality space, which is actually also run by Assemble. Um, and then we've got parcel and lending library. The lending library is actually, uh, it's full of objects that you might only, that you might buy and only use once every couple of months, like a slow cooker or a dehydrator, those sort of Things. So the idea is that collectively you sort of share those things and um, it sort of improves efficiency in sort of people's storage and stuff. The other thing that's really cool about assembled buildings is that the car parking is designed so it can be retrofitted into other uses in the future. One of the big issues with most apartment buildings is that each individual apartment owns an individual car space, so it's all strata titled. With assembled buildings, the car park is all held under one title and for the first five years you rent car spaces off assemble and then after five years, the body corporate owns that space. Because the thing about it is we don't know what the future of car ownership is gonna look like. The number of cars we included in here um, were based on the surveys that we did uh, of the prospective purchases and who needed a car. I think the whole car ownership thing is quite a complicated one, but the truth about it is a lot of people actually need cars. Our key workers need cars. You know, If you're a plumber, you need a truck. If you've got mobility needs, you'll need a car and also uh, people with families. So the idea here is that this is not just a car park buried in the basement, it's got windows onto a laneway and onto the street. So some views of the apartment, of the, of the lobby space, you can see through to the, uh, the workshop, this is the workshop uh, space there. And the idea of placing it right at the front is it becomes this kind of little moment of neighborliness. You know, you kind of get chatting to people perhaps, or at least you know them by sight. On level one, we've got uh, communal washing lines and we've got a dog wash area. That's a little herb garden, dog wash area. So we really advertise this idea of this building being great for kids and for pets. And there's 76 apartments and we've got 50 dogs, which is bonkers. But anyway, uh, and there's just little things like the dog washing area, making all the circulation spaces like super dog friendly. And also we designed panels into the sliding doors that you could go in and retrofit a dog door into. So little moves like that. So the typical floor plan has really got, um, you can see there's the lift and, and the stairs, uh, and then through the middle is the walkway, and then each individual apartment has got a little bridge across to it. This is actually a void that's cut through the building. It's actually an example of how you can turn a potential design problem into something beautiful. So the builders actually asked for this large square cutout here so they could put the tower crane in there. And I thought that was gonna stuff our designer completely, and I was pretty miserable about it for a couple of days. But then I drew a half circle, and it turned into something beautiful. Um, so one thing that's lovely about these walkways is you get these views from level to level. You know, you really get a sense of what's going on on the other floors of the building. You get these diagonal views down, and you can see that people are starting to inhabit that space. I'm personally in this field work really interested in the sort of in-between spaces and these classic sort of walk-ups that you get in Melbourne, the way the internal life of the apartment sort of spills out into that communal space is of real interest to us. And so we're sort of hoping to do a version of that. And you can see the sort of light qualities coming down through it. Also quite fascinated by the Victorian Terrace House front veranda. So that kind of interstitial space. And in fact, I lived in a house not dissimilar to this one for like 10 years in Brunswick. And we had our bedroom right there and our neighbors would walk right past. And the veranda was a really nice sort of buffer. 
And the veranda is also a really lovely spot to sit with your back to the building and interact with your neighbors. It's a really nice sort of in-between space. So we've tried to do that in this building. They've, each of the apartments has got a little front veranda. And these sort of little moments as well around of, of bench seats and trying to make that sort of circulation space somewhere that you want to inhabit as well. And then some of the interiors, you know, there's not a huge amount that's interesting about the interiors. We just try to do nice, high quality sort of interiors. I should note it's 100% electric. I'm going to talk about sustainability later on because it's a major issue for us and this is a big critique is that we all are sucking badly at it right now. But um, one thing that's great about this building is it's all 100% green power. And in fact, Assemble's made a deal with Hepburn Wind. So there's a couple of uh, big wind turbines powering this building, which is really awesome. This is the top floor, um, and this is the communal terrace on the top floor. We're actually running an open house Melbourne tour. So if any of you are interested to see the building, it's much better than looking at photos of it. Please come along. And then there's a multi-purpose communal room. So look, lots of buildings are delivering all kinds of stuff like gyms and things that you just don't really need. We really try to distill it down to things that our prospective purchaser, our prospective residents would actually really want to use. And one of those things is a multi-purpose communal room. So on the top floor there, we've got this room. And it's designed so it can be almost like people's shared scout hall. Like if you're in a little neighborhood, you hire the scout hall. It's got a little commercial kitchen. You can have a kid's party there. Uh, it's got the best views as well. So it really democratizes the sort of best views. And the reason I know this works is that I'm actually living in the first assembled project in Rosney Street, Clifton Hill. And uh, that's been a really wonderful living, breathing laboratory for me. So I'm not an architect who's living in some sort of cantilevered mansion in Brighton. I'm living in one of my own projects, albeit in a pretty good apartment, but still. Um, it's been a really great uh, and very humbling experience for me to actually live through COVID in an apartment building with my, with my fellow residents. And it's really focused in on like, what makes for a good neighborly building. The next project I want to show you, I'm going to move through these quite quickly, uh, is an educational project which we completed uh, late last year and it's just had the first students move in. It's a little smug of me to show you this sketch, but this is like the first sketch I did. And it got built pretty much as is, which I'm pretty excited about. It's very rare in practice that the first concept nails it. Um, but essentially what it is, it's a, it's a state school. It's designed for the most high achieving state school students in the whole state to be able to come to a facility and do university level subjects. So it's sort of this transition between high school and primary school. So not in primary school and secondary school, sorry. So we didn't want to do this space to sort of, you know, and honestly, quite a lot of high school and especially primary school, but certainly some high school design is quite patronizing, I think, to the students. You know, like one thing about teenagers, they want to be treated like, like adults ultimately. So I wanted it to be quite, so it sounds a bit cliche, but kind of quite adult feeling space. We worked with Do uh, Professor Ben Cleveland, who actually works in the faculty here. He's an amazing pedagogical design uh, theorist, and we really tried to make this building reflective of the sort of, you know, the best sort of thinking when it came to pedagogy. And it really boiled down to simple things, like that classrooms, you want to be able to track the seasons. You want to have natural light. You want to have ventilation. You want to have views onto living things. So the site we had was totally contrary to that, because what it is, it's on Chapel Street. So that's Chapel Street that runs up and down the page there. It's next to Melbourne High. It's a pretty urban, pretty tough sort of spot to do this. So the concept really was to have this large central atrium to fill that with living things, plants, and then to make the ground plane quite public and sort of porous and connect Chapel Street, on the, which is on the left-hand side, across to Melbourne High on the right. So here's an axonometric view of the building. So you can really see Chapel Street's on the left. That's the atrium through the middle. Because I was also really keen to overcome, and I should say that this was done in collaboration with our friends at Brand Architects. So they're an education specialist. Um, so it was a collaboration between Fieldwork and Brand. I, I should mention that. Um, so really from a concept point of view, one of the challenges was we don't want it to feel like this kind of sandwich of different layers. How can we make people, when they come in, the students come in, they feel the kind of vertical energy. They can feel the energy of the whole place. So that atrium really helps to do that as well. So the central atrium space also allows for natural ventilation into all the classroom spaces. It allows for natural light to come filtering in. Uh, ETFE roof, it's an inflatable roof. 
uh, and it's got two layers with dots printed on them, and the more it's inflated, the less shadow it casts. So it's really beautiful adapting to light conditions. Large auditorium space at the bottom, and I kind of almost made it like feel a bit like a boring uni lecture theater to get them ready, you know? Uh, but it's got nice views out to the garden. And then, so that's the whole sort of public realm, and then the classrooms facing out onto Melbourne High or onto the, onto the street. You'll see also we've got planter boxes on the outside because we're really keen that those who can't look down into the atrium have also got beautiful plants in their foreground. And then on the top, we've got an outdoor uh, terrace area. So here's some plan views of it. Uh, which I'll flick through quite quickly, but you can see that sort of atrium. And we we're very conscious about tucking the lift away and kind of almost hiding it. And it's actually sort of in quite a seamless wall. And we've got this really prominent staircase. And everyone uses the staircase, which is really wonderful. We wanted everyone using that staircase. And that's the sort of top floor. We worked with our friends at OpenWork. We wanted the facades to be really quite plain and simple. And also, we couldn't afford to do frivolous stuff with this. I wanted to spend all the money on the inside of the project. So you've got these planter boxes, fins for shading, pretty simple sort of robust stuff. It's actually got beautiful plants sort of cascading down already. Um, but pretty utilitarian exterior. But the idea is you then walk in, and inside is this beautiful atrium space. So it's all clad in a sustainably harvested uh, Victorian timber. Uh, it's, you can really get that sort of sense of volume. And in the bottom, we've got this beautiful fern garden starting to grow. And these are indigenous ferns growing in the bottom. So the idea is it's like, it feels a bit like a, um, if you go to the Dandenongs, there's a little kind of ferny gully, that kind of feeling. And you can see there the staircase. You can really get that kind of energy of the building up above you. And you can see the dots uh, reflected on the glass there of the roof, the ETFE roof there. So we filled it, because it's a really tight site, we filled it with lots of nooks and crannies and spaces of all different sizes. Because one observation of teenagers, they like hanging out in nooks and in different group sizes and, you know, really to make it a very, a space that's got lots of little habitable spaces. And then this is a view back from the atrium. There's a kind of cafeteria type space in the middle there of the view. And then the auditorium space uh, with big curtains that you can open up so you can see out onto the beautiful landscape beyond. I was very keen the building didn't sort of hide anything it was doing, so the structure's super apparent, and I'll talk about the structure a bit more. The services are all super apparent. The way it's all put together is super apparent. And also didn't want to have any, or minimize applied finishes, so it's all pretty raw stuff, like timber, bits of concrete, wood wool, um, you know, living sort of plants, uh, and sort of bit of glass. So there's the staircase with the sort of views through, so it's actually a transparent staircase all the way through. And then from the levels above, you can see across to the other classrooms. So I was really keen that you kind of got this connection through the space and then views down into the atrium uh, spaces. When well. you get this beautiful sort of dappled light coming through those dots. Um, and then some more views of the staircase. And then that idea of this kind of honesty of material. So really just leaving the concrete exposed. I mentioned before that we're all sucking really badly at being sustainable, and I'll talk more about it at the end, but we're always really pushing to the big thing is to try and decarbonize the construction. So we are really big advocates for CLT. We did one of the first cross-laminated timber buildings in Australia, which is uh, uh, 21 townhouses in Brunswick, uh, and we've continued to try and push cross-laminated timber. It's a really great way of decarbonizing construction. We couldn't make it work with this project because of the clients, but what we were able to do was to radically reduce the amount of concrete used by doing a hybrid timber and concrete structure. So what we've got is we've got beams in concrete and columns in concrete, um, but the slabs are way thinner because we've got timber laminated veneer beams running through. So if you can't convince a client to do CLT, the next best step is a hybrid sort of structure. And then some of the classroom type spaces, and you see how happy the students are? Joking, those aren't students, they're actually our team members, uh, posing as students. Um, the, it's got really great facilities, like these sort of laboratories, so there's all these sort of technical sides as well. We are gonna try and organize an open day there as well, if you're interested to come along. Um, but you know, that idea of views out to landscape from every sort of space was really important. And then all these sort of nooks and crannies we created for the students, all different sort of sizes and shapes. Um, and the colors, we try to keep it pretty sort of toned down, but there's the odd little moment of a kind of little splash of kind of color. And then this is the rage cage, we call it. It's this sort of a creeper uh, sort of cage thing to hang out with on the roof. And then out the back, we've got this little garden space. 
and we worked with our friends at OpenWork. We really love working with OpenWork. They're just the most beautiful landscapers. And again, this sort of lovely landscape space we designed with them at the back. So Collingwood Yards is a project we're very, very proud of. About seven years ago, we were just an emerging practice. You know, we'd only done a couple of projects. We hadn't really built much. And we got invited as the kind of wild card. We're up against you know, all the great practices of Melbourne, BKK, KTA, uh, FKA, all those sort of people. And we kicked their butts. Yeah. So why, why Collingwood Yards? Well, Collingwood Yards, what it was is a not-for-profit organization came together with a mandate to try and provide affordable accommodation for all the sort of great creative practice that was happening, uh, the cultural production that was happening in Collingwood, which was being sort of priced out of Collingwood by the kind of inevitable change of development. So this Tim Gurner quote, we actually found this quote at the time of the original competition. It's like a perfect quote. I'm not going to read it out for you. Um, so ironically, he'd actually just bought this site immediately adjacent to Collingwood Yards, which was a place called, um, I can't remember what it was called actually. Anyway, it was this lovely warehouse full of artists and creative businesses. It was this really thriving community there. And just after we'd um, heard that we were shortlisted for the competition, I did what I always do, and in fact I always urge, I urge all of you to do this, is you've got to visit the site during the day and at night. I always go at night to sites. It's really important. I always try and go on the weekends if I can. Um, so I was there at night. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I just had a beer down at the tote, and I was sort of stumbling back, going, okay, well, what am I going to design? What am I going to design here? And I saw across the road, oh, it was called Magic Johnson. That's what it was called. Um, a glowing window. And in the window was my friend Stuart Geddes. And none of you probably know who Stuart Geddes is. Rory Hyde probably does. He's an amazing book designer. He's a classic dude. He's like classic Melbourne dude. So I tapped on the window. He's like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, we just got shortlisted for this competition next door. Anyway, we got chatting. And the result of that conversation was that we actually did a book as part of our submission for the competition. I think it's part of the reason we won. But the reason I tell you this kind of silly story is that that moment really unlocked the project for me because it made me realize that that kind of encounter would have never happened had there not been that interface between the public and the private realm of the sort of creative industry. So in a way, we kind of designed Collingwood Yards to harness the power of physical space to that physical proximity. We kind of designed it to be the opposite of Microsoft Teams before Microsoft Teams were in, in our sort of consciousness. So this is actually what's been built next door. Sorry about the crappy photo. I actually just took it this morning, but I just went past and I was like, what? So I don't know what the hell this building is. To me, it sort of looks like, I, I was trying to think like how to describe it. And the best way I can describe it is it's sort of like this blob of late capitalist dark matter is what I reckon it is. And there's this funny thing that happens with developers. And I'm not saying that all development is bad, right? But there's just certain developers who like to name their projects after things they've destroyed. <laughs> you know? This project should have been called, you know, hell yeah, negative gearing or something like that. Or, fuck you young people, you'll never afford it. But instead they call it Atelier because, you know, they, it's all about creative Collingwood, etc. Anyway, I could go on for hours. I don't want to sound like I'm whinging about it. But it just comes to show that, you know, there is a lot of these old buildings that are being knocked down and being replaced by something where cultural production is no longer really possible. And... Look, you've probably had a whole bunch of middle-aged lecturers giving you quotes of uh, Jan Jacobs, but I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a Jan Jacobs quote now. It's a little bit boring, but she did say one thing that I thought was pretty, pretty good. The rest is all a bit sort of white tears for my liking, but uh, she said uh, that old buildings are like mulch and that beautiful things can grow from these old things. And we're losing that kind of urban mulch, you know, and I think in a way what we're trying to do is with Collingwood Yards do a bit of that. So back to the book. We did this book, which was about mapping out the cultural ecology of Collingwood. And we did that sort of love letter to the existing building. So we got our friend Tom Ross to take these photos. And we have done this ever since with all our sites. Because it gets you to look through the eyes of a photographer. You start appreciating it in a different way. And it's a really beautiful, it was a really beautiful building, the quality of light, the textures, the colors, the kind of surfaces. But it was a completely derelict uh, complex of buildings at the time. We also, as part of the process of getting to know the site, we did the most insanely detailed SketchUp model ever. Uh, my ex-teammate, might be one of the reasons he left actually, Piers, who now works with Dreamer, is an awesome dude. I got him to model even all the graffiti in. I felt a bit guilty about that. But anyway, 
Uh, what was wonderful about it, though, is it made us realize that actually the building was playing quite an important role with all the posters on it. So it actually catalyzed us to make sure that we reintroduced the ability to put, still put posters onto the building. And also it taught us that it's important with the new building not to be too sort of precious. So what did we do from a design point of view? So it was a sort of derelict complex of buildings. It's got the Keith Herring mural on it. The design competition submission had two key ideas. The first one was that the obvious entrance to the precinct isn't the right entrance to the precinct. So everyone thought, oh yeah, let's go through there. It's the main entrance, that's great, you know? But it doesn't, you know? Like, it says all these things about, you know, 1930s ideas of sort of human progress, but it doesn't say everyone's welcome to this place. It doesn't say there's a place for new ideas. It doesn't say, you know, whatever your background, you know, whatever your sort of culture is, you're welcome here. Definitely doesn't say that. So we took the path of most resistance because it's a pretty serious heritage facade, you know? We've decided let's punch a hole in it. Let's punch through it and get into that courtyard and, and make it an, an entrance that can speak new things, that can say new things. So here's an axonometric diagram. Uh, field work, we love doing axonometric diagrams. We love really sort of diagramming our design ideas. So here's a cutaway, and it shows that first green arrow is that that entrance really unlocked the central courtyard, because we were blessed from day one with a really beautiful central courtyard. I mean, it was full of sort of old crappy bits of building and stuff that we peeled away, but there's these lovely trees there. So that allowed us to come in on grade. And then we put a secondary entrance through the back, because the aspiration was to make the building really porous, to invite the broader neighborhood and the broader community in, so that the broader community can actually observe and hopefully participate in the process of cultural production, you know? Because a lot of the places where cultural production happens are quite closed off. We wanted to invite people in. The other thing that sucks about old buildings is they can be quite beautiful and whatever, but if you've got a mobility issue or you've got a pram or big heavy artwork, they're terrible. Or if you're in a fire, it really sucks. So we had to put new staircases and things like that, and I'll talk about those in a moment. So this is what the new entrance looks like. You can all go there and have a look. Um, I should mention these columns, because I wanted it to be this sort of almost portal into another world, you know, with this sort of micro perforated stainless steel. And the idea was it's sort of quite an urban feeling entrance. And after we finished, we actually stood and did observation for a few hours. And it was quite interesting. People would walk up Johnson Street and they'd go past the Art Deco entry and not even take a second glance. But then they'd stop here and they'd look in and quite often would go in. So that sort of sense of invitation worked. But these two columns were not meant to be there. Halfway through construction, we were told by the builders that if we could keep the columns, we'd get a 200 grand saving. So I thought, bloody hell, this is gonna stuff the project, stuff my beautiful vision. And they also wanted it in a uh, high contrast color so people wouldn't walk into it. But then I had this brain wave because my partner, Eugenia Lim, who's um, a wonderful artist, she was actually doing a project on Robin Boyd's legacy in a gold suit. So we had this real gold vibe going on at home and I thought, Let's gold leaf the bloody things. And it uh, worked out to be a really successful thing to do because it still shows the kind of brickwork, the texture, but it's transforming into something else. I didn't want that sort of ye olde brick look in there. So then stepping through, you get to see uh, the main courtyard, looking back into it. We're also keen to kind of add a kind of festive layer. We're really interested in fieldwork and lighting design. So we actually designed this to be all, the whole precinct has got an RGB LED system, which is fully programmable. Um, so at night, it becomes a pretty sort of interesting looking place. And I thought, because you're students of architecture, I'd show you this. I've got some images here from my original design competition. And it's quite fascinating looking at what kind of got built versus what we originally conceived. And it was funny, we were working in SketchUp world where everything is white. And we thought, let's do this out of Cortan. But then as soon as we got the real material, hold on, Cortan's gonna really suck here because it's all kind of red brick. Anyway, this is sort of interesting uh, contrast. So that's sort of walking into the courtyard. And then you get these sort of beautiful lighting effects in there with the RGB and the gold and um, sort of becomes quite a sort of, quite interested in the place being very different at night from the day. And that idea of visiting sites always at night, trying to see them in different modes can sort of inspire you to think more about, you know, the different modes of use of it. Technically, it was a super complicated project. We actually put a radio station in underneath the building. So actually, it looks like a sort of quite a relaxed place, but it was a, a really challenging construction process. And then the laneway at the back. So we sort of punched a little laneway through the back. There was an existing laneway. We pulled all the bluestone up, sliced the top off, 
um, and then relayed it down. And then the windows sliced down to the ground. And instead of putting like a black trim that a lot of architects like to do, I wanted to keep it quite evident what we'd done. So with keen eyes, you can say, oh, that used to be a window. Let's, we're not pretending it's anything else. And then in there, we did a little sort of shopping arcade, Uro Bookshop. We are blessed to have an architecture bookshop in Melbourne. You all go, go and spend all your money there, okay? To have a bricks and mortar architecture shop is the most beautiful thing. And then stepping through to the courtyard. The courtyard, all we really did to the courtyard was we worked with SBLA Landscape and her team, but it was a way, really tried to just pull out the old building matter that was there uh, and open it up so it could become a really public space. And it gets used incredibly well for events and markets. And the second big move was that the existing building, we didn't want to stuff around with it too much. So to get it up to code and access, we thought we'd actually clip all the new infrastructure on the outside of the building and try and make them objects of beauty in themselves. And that completely unlocked the project because try and punch a lift shaft through an existing heritage building, very challenging and expensive, but clipping it on the outside, um, a lot more cost effective. And we were keen to make them sort of objects that were interesting in themselves, you know, quite sort of sculptural objects. That's my daughter in the foreground. This is in the top of the, um, uh, the Yu Yangs. Really fascinated, by the way, when national parks see these sort of cool boulders or cool tree, they build these things around it. So that was the direct influence. The other one was I actually went to the first dark mofo in Tassie many years ago, and uh, there was a concert at night. It was in the back laneway in Hobart, and the performers performed from the steel staircase. It sounds a little bit kind of corny now, but it was actually mind-blowing at the time. And I was like, ah, oh, staircases can be performance spaces. So that kind of inspired the idea that, you know, try and make it quite performative. And what's been lovely is the community within Collingwood Yards have really embraced the architecture. There's a lot of custom um, sort of projections and works that have been created for the kind of architecture as well. This is the before and after um, of the main courtyard, sort of created a bit of an amphitheater space, and then that form sitting through there. Again, competition concept stuff. There and there, and then what we built. Uh, so again, that idea of quite sort of sculptural form um, and then these sort of cantilevered platforms. And what's been quite beautiful about this particular architectural element is that, uh, a lot, like I mentioned before, a lot of artwork's been created for it. So the Center for Projection Arts actually got an ongoing program of projections for uh, the lift shaft, which is really great. And everyone's like, oh, it's gonna be the wrong proportion for that. No, they actually really love the fact that it's a, it's a weird proportion. And there's also been performances. This. Um, uh, tenant actually did a concert playing instruments and the architecture. So I was pretty happy about that. Pretty jolly time. Uh, and then there's a great rooftop bar. That's what the building looked. This is a pretty typical what the building looked like before. A lot of what we did was just peeling layers away. So we actually looked at the history of this and the evidence in the building that this used to be an outdoor corridor. So we pulled the windows out and turned it into this lovely outdoor sort of semi-outdoor space. Uh, this little moment of gold glass in the existing building and we decided that every new window or opening that we created, we'd put a little piece of this gold glass in there. And it's been really beautiful seeing how, and it was just a little romantic moment. Like we just captured this photograph, Tom Ross did. He saw it through slightly different eyes. And I just thought that that was such a wonderful moment that we decided to introduce that gold glass. And it's actually sort of inspired some of the internal fit outs of the spaces as well. The big moves in Collingwood Yards we made super obvious. But as we went down through the scales, we really blurred what was new and old. And we also, we didn't make judgments about what was good to keep and what wasn't good to keep. Like we were pretty neutral about that. We just tried to keep everything we could. So these different layers of different paint colors, we didn't want to Botox the building. You know, like sometimes you go to these heritage buildings that have been redone, they look like Kim Kardashian's kind of forehead. You know, we don't want that. We want it nice and wrinkly and, you know, showing its age and being a relaxing place to be. Um, so before I finish, I just want to say, like, what are the current preoccupations in field work? Uh, our buildings are getting to look more and more boring because we're more and more interested in what they do, not what they look like. And really, the big, big focus for us is sustainability broadly. Like, the truth about it is, I mean, as architects, we always work on this notion of offsets. And I don't mean carbon offsets, which are kind of BS anyway, or a lot of them are BS, is this idea that you're doing this great piece of community infrastructure, therefore it's okay if it's got some, it's creating some damage to the ecosystem. 
Where we want to work towards and where we're very focused in field work is how can we deliver this community infrastructure, this cultural infrastructure, this housing infrastructure in a way that doesn't uh, cause ecological damage, you know? And it's very easy now to do like, you know, zero carbon in, in operation. It's very easy to do all electric. The big issues that we're tackling right now is the, is the ecological damage inherent in the construction of the building through the carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions, and also the broader ecological damage caused by the materials in architecture. And I think that as architects, that's the big challenge for us over the next few decades. I think that's what we've got to really focus on, because I think for too long, we've been going, oh, isn't this a wonderful building? This is great. Well, actually, no, it really sucks for the, it's been terrible for the climate. It's been really bad for the ecosystem where we've pulled all this material out of. So, um, so that's, you know, I think, for us is we are really, I suppose, turning our kind of architectural toolkit, our sort of strategic thinking towards that. We're training up the team to be, you know, Green Star accredited, Passive House accredited, because what we really want to do is that as architects, not just rely on sustainability consultants, we want to have the toolkit within field work to help inform our clients and sort of help them move towards a more sustainable future. So that's it, thank you.